as I was thinking about this week and praying about this week and trying to figure out what I was going to speak about, I really sensed with what's going on in my life and what's going on around me that I would want to speak about the power of words. Then this afternoon, I saw a letter that was sent to Shoresh. Uh, should have been probably sent to the Shabbat school because the Shabbat school was responsible for giving last week the Purim baskets to a number of people. Um, but it says, dear friends at Shoresh, you all have been so thoughtful and kind and generous to John and me. So this is coming from uh, Mary Jane, uh, John Schmidt's wife, um, who uh, John just went through a uh, knee replacement, and it's been somewhat difficult uh, for him. And he's gone through some things prior to that. So then she says, with his surgeries and now recoveries, what a blessing you all have been over these weeks. We enjoyed a delicious dinner prepared and delivered by Yossi and Becca. So good. And then Alex and Lisa brought the most beautiful roses in celebration of our 60th anniversary. We enjoyed those beautiful flowers for just about three weeks, along with the roses were beautiful white strawberries that were enjoyed as well. The Purim basket last evening. But what? Oh, I see. So the Purim basket last evening, delivered by Alex and Lisa, was fun for John to open it up and find so many goodies, both edible and useful. We also enjoy, enjoyed a nice time of fellowship with Alex and Lisa. A special thank you to Zion for the handmade turtle. What beautiful talent to hand make a soft, cuddly, and sweet little turtle. So very thoughtful of Zion to make a special gift for John. Please let her know that the turtle will be given to our newest great-grandchild, Shepherd, born just a week and a half ago, a special gift on a special day for a special child of God from Sweet Zion. You have blessed us many times over, and we thank God for your love and fellowship. Now, the reason I read this is because as I will be talking about how important our words are, also important are our actions. And I, I really believe that when we hear something like this, it should make us motivated to do things for others. And that's who we should be. We should, uh, you know, our love for people should be seen by what we do and what we say. So it, maybe in a few weeks we'll be talking about what we do, but I just really felt I need... Oh, and, and let me just mention, uh, how old Zion is? What is she? 11? Thank you. 11, okay. So... I can't tell you how many people who have gotten Purim baskets have mentioned what Zion made. Uh, it, it's really a blessing. So here's this 11-year-old who's made these, these little fuzzy, I guess, I don't know if they were all turtles, crocheted turtles. So, so I just mention this to say when people say, well, what can I do? What can I do at Shoresh David? Bless somebody. <laughs> That's it. That's what you do. You walk around and you find out who they are and you bless them. Bless them in word. Bless them in deed. This is, I believe, how we show God's love. 
and uh, I was excited to, and, and we've, I, I could actually read more of what some other people said about the Purim basket. It, it, it's really a blessing. You know, many people are focused in these weeks. You know, the church has Easter. We will be celebrating Passover in a few weeks. So people are focused on God and what he has done. And so oftentimes when we're focused on God, we want to say, God, what can we do to please you? What, what can we do? And uh, how can we become a, a better disciple? Um, and when I think about that, oftentimes I think about my speech. And is my speech the way God wants it? And I'd like you to consider with me the power of the word, or words, I should say. In, in God's case, you know, um, obviously, he made the world with his words. And so we see the power right there, uh, you know, and, and that's pretty amazing that words can make this, this universe or the, this, this, the, the, this place we live uh, is, is incredible to think about. But we, too, have power in our words. We can make people happy or sad. We can encourage them. We can anger them. And we can do much more. We, we can start a war with words. We can break down emotional barriers with words. And we can begin a beautiful love story and continue a beautiful love story with words. And so as we think about how we use words, we must first decide one question, or we need to answer one question that's so critical, and that is, are we willing to follow God's way or the world's way? Because the world is constantly demonstrating how they think we should speak. And we need to hear from God. So everything we do should start with God and, his des and, and what is his desire for us. God wants people to see him in us. And we want to please the Lord to that ability. So we're going to begin with Hebrews 11.3, just again to talk about the power of God's word. And we see by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen did not come from anything visible. Ponder that for a while. Talk about miracles. Talk about amazing things that God wants us to fathom, to understand. You know, you can, God created the world, but can we create the world? Obviously not. But boy, can we create a lot with our words. We create the atmosphere in the room with our words. And Scripture is filled, filled with, I, you know, I couldn't begin to go through all the scriptures on how we should speak. We know that in Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the control of the tongue. And so God is asking us to use that self-control, that fruit of the Spirit, so that our tongue represents him. And he represents life, right? Um, many people who are in need of God and are looking at, they're, they're going to be looking at you and me. And they're going to look at our actions and they're going to look at our words. Ephesians 4.29, which we talked about Ephesians 4 a few weeks ago when we talked about the laws in the New Covenant, and we used Ephesians 4 for that. Um, 
It says, let no harmful word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for building others up according to the need, so that it gives grace to those who hear it. So our words are to give grace to people. Our words are to build people up. Our words are not to be harmful. Now, there are a number of people who would say, but what if you've got to tell the truth and it's not encouraging? And that's a pretty good question, I think, because your tendency is to say, well, I've got to tell the truth. So imagine that your friend's kids or your friend are in a musical and you've gone to the musical and ugh, it was awful. <laughs> it was terrible. Just imagine that for a second. And here comes your friend. What do you say? Well, I've got to be truthful and I'm saying this in love. But it was awful. <laughs> no, you don't say that. Well, you better not say that. So, how can you get away by not saying that? Well, first is, you have to figure out why you want to say that. Now, you can say it's because I always want to tell the truth, but the real thing is the I want. And so the question is, is that person who's walking towards you more important, bless you, more important than you? And that's another question you have to deal with God about. Are you making other people more important? And you realize how those words are going to hurt them. So now we're dealing with truth versus hurt. What do you do? And it would be my understanding that you find some way to say something nice. And you have to be creative. You can't just blurt what's out of your mouth, in your heart, and your thinking, because that's easy. And boy, I've done that plenty of times. That's where the foot goes into the mouth, right? You understand. You have to figure out some way to say something encouraging. You'd like, and I don't know what it would be, but boy, you really, guys, you must have worked so hard to do this production or something. But, you know, it, I think it's really important. It, look, at another time, you can sit down and say, eh, you know, you might want to volunteer your efforts to help them sing better or something like that. Romans 10, 14, and 15. How then shall they call on the one whom they've trusted? And how shall they trust in the one they have not heard of? And how shall they hear without someone proclaiming? So we are the proclaimers, by the way. And how shall they proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good, th of, of good things. Look, our words can be written and they can be spoken. And both have power. God's word in both cases has power. The, the scripture is an example of words being used in this case to bring salvation. And as we talk to people about the Lord and they accept the Lord, this is one of the reasons that we've got a voice. This is one of the reasons we can speak to proclaim who God is. And so there's power in that word. Communicating is a gift from God. No, animals don't communicate like we do. They don't have the written word, really, or the, the spoken word. God entrusted that gift to you and me. God uses this gift so that we would know him and develop a relationship with him. The Bible is the written word communicating to each one of us. 
It tells us who God is, what he's done, and actually what he's going to do. And here's the thing. God takes what we say extremely seriously. Extremely seriously. For instance, Romans 10, 9 and 10. You know that. If you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. With the heart, it is believed for righteousness, and with the mouth, it is confessed for salvation. God has given us such powerful words that those words take from our heart and present to him that we are to receive salvation from him because of our proclamation. That's how powerful our word is. But God is not finished with the seriousness of our words. You've, you've heard this before because I've quoted this, I think, a few times in the past couple months. Matthew 12, 31. Actually, it's going to come a little later. Matthew 12, 31. For this reason I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Ruach, the Spirit, will not be forgiven. Now, it goes on to explain what that is. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven, neither in this age nor in the one to come. I mean, if you take God at his word about these words, this is serious. And then he says further on, and in, in Matthew 12, 34, starting with 34b to 37, for from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means that we can tell what's in a person's heart by what they say. Ooh. <laughs> and then it says, the good man... Uh, from uh, the good man from his good treasury brings forth good, and the evil man from the evil treasury brings forth evil. Your heart is a treasury. It's, it's like a, a, a box, in a sense, where the treasure is. And you place your thoughts and emotions, and you store them there. And then your mouth speaks what your heart has been thinking. Maybe your heart isn't as good as you thought it was. Possibly. And then that verse in 36, chapter 12 of Matthew, verse 36. But I tell you, on that day of judgment, men will give account for every careless word they speak. There is nobody in this sanctuary who has not spoken a careless word. Now, the question is, how many, and are we practicing that, or are we stopping that as much as we can? For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Now, it doesn't seem in Scripture that God gives us an out. You know, like, uh, do you realize how mean they were to me. I had to say something back. Yes, that's true. But was it a God word, a God thought, or was it a world thought? And God is very clear here about that we're going to be justified by our words, and certainly we will be condemned by our words. So if you take God seriously, then I believe you have to take his words seriously. A 
Ephesians 4.1 gives us a sense, it doesn't talk about the word, but it gives us a sense of how the word is supposed to be given. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you were called. Okay? Now, we've been called by the Lord. If you're a believer, you've been called. And we are to be called with complete humility. It's not enough to be humble. You have to be completely humble. <laughs> and gentle, with gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, making every effort to keep unity of the Ruach in the bond of Shalom. Then later on in Ephesians 4.29, again, it sounds a lot like other things we've said. Let no harmful word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for building others up according to the need so that it gives grace to those who hear it. God gave us the gift of words in order to build people up, to strengthen one another. If you have time to think before you speak, you should try and remember what the purpose of your words are. Normally, we don't allow time before we speak to think. It just comes out. It comes out from our feelings. But we are to strengthen one another. Now, in order to be strong enough to do this, I'm going to give you three things that I believe are key to being strong. Number one, you should overlook the offense. In Proverbs 19.11, it says, Prudence makes one slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook an offense. God's giving you glory, in a sense, if you overlook an offense. Two, forgive. Matthew 16, 15, but if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. Again, a very serious scripture for us to contemplate. And the third is that you've got to realize, and this is so hard to do, that this is a spiritual battle. And we have to deal with this in the spiritual realm. Our prayer life should be strengthened by the difficulties that we're going through. And I would suggest that if you can't pray for yourself, because I know that sometimes it's hard to pray for yourself, it's easier to pray for other people, hard to pray for yourself, then get somebody to pray with you. Because in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly forces of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We see so many scriptures about our words. Colossians 3, let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly. You know, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with gratitude in our heart to God. I mean, the picture of who we are from God's perspective is the bar is like extremely high. Extremely high. Colossians 4, 6. Six, let, let your speech always be with grace. You know, and then we see 
back to Ephesians 4, verse 30. Do not grieve. This is the second time about grieving the Ruach HaKodesh of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is how you grieve the, the, the Holy Spirit. So it's saying get rid of all bitterness. Well, not if you get rid of it. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and quarreling and slander and all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God and Messiah also forgave you. So this is what God is requiring of us and our words and our, even our thoughts and maybe in a coming up message we can talk about our thoughts and our heart because that's really where our words stem from. First Peter 3, 15 and 16, instead sanctify Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Again, with humility and reverence. So we, we see that God has, again, put the, the bar up extremely high. I'd like to close with a few other scriptures. Luke 4.22 422. This is talking about Yeshua. All were speaking well of him and marveling at the gracious words coming out of his mouth. And they were saying, isn't this the son of Joseph? Now this is a very interesting scripture because on one hand you have people who are listening to the words and they are marveled at the graciousness of Yeshua. And so they're thinking of him in, as, with a lots of great reputation, in, in high regard, right? But then there's one who says, well, ho, 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 hold on a second. Isn't this the son of Joseph? I mean, like, isn't this guy a common man? I mean, wh what are we talking about here? I think we're overrating Yeshua a bit. One word, and now we see the fights on for the people who heard both sides. On one side of this fight, we have the people who heard gracious Yeshua. On the other side, the world is presenting, eh, he's only the son of Joseph. Who's going to win in your heart? Daily, we have to make that choice. Daily, we have to make that choice. So what can you do? Well, two things I'll, I'll mention. Number one, the heart of Messiah requires humility. Allow, allow God to teach and direct you which is why we're reading the scriptures. <laughs> First Peter 5, 5 through 7, Likewise, you younger ones, submit yourselves to the elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may lift you up at the appropriate time. Cast all your worries on him, for he cares for you. This means... We have to be humble. And I'll let you define humility. I mean, that's a whole nother message. What does humility actually look like in the real world? In the real world. The second thing that I always suggest for people, I do this, I feel it's really part of what I need from the Lord and that is, I pray scripture. And so I believe that when you pray scripture, when you take time out and allow that scripture to go deep into your spirit, 
God's going to change you from inside out. Because the big question is, well, how can I change how I feel? By putting God's word so deep into you that it knocks the garbage out of you, you don't have to do that. You just have to bring God's word in to do the cleaning. And so when we say in Psalm 1915, and I spoke about that before in my prayer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that kind of covers both angles, doesn't it? Be acceptable before you, Adonai. You are my rock and you are my redeemer. To focus in on that, verse gives your mind and your heart more of a understanding of God's desire for us and your willingness to do it. Because I, I again, I believe scriptures will push aside those things that are impure in our lives. We've not been trained this way. We haven't been trained this way. But we need to be trained this way, I believe. We have been allowed to speak first because that's how we feel and think later. Join with me. You can tr feel free to make me accountable. If you hear garbage from me, call me on it. Hopefully I won't hit you. <laughs> Just kidding. Join with me and let's try and change. Let's try and change. The world will be a better place if we practice encouragement, if our words are filled with love, if we are humble in how we do everything. And part of that is actually receiving Yeshua. If there's anybody here who has never through a humble spirit, just said, Lord, I need Yeshua in my life. I need that kind of strength. I need the fact that my sins will be washed clean. I need Yeshua. If you've never said that, please say it now. Just say, by faith I receive Yeshua in my heart as my Messiah and Lord, and I repent of my sins, and I dedicate my life to him forever. And if you said those words, especially for the first time, feel free to contact me if you're here, certainly after service, but if you're on Facebook Live, call our office, please. We'd love to speak with you. We'd love to share some things that will help your journey, give you a, a gift. So call us, please. Let us know. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that your word is power. And I ask that we would have a heart that is powerful to support the power of the words that we speak. Lord, let our heart be for you. Let our hearts be from you. Lord, mold us, Lord. Mold us so that we will please you. And you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. We bless you and thank you. In the name of Yeshua, amen.